Let's do it, Sean. Hey, everybody. Everybody, hey. This is Sean Horowell. You are listening to the Never Heard of It podcast, and I am happy to be here today. This is episode 55. Uh, It's part something of our 1985 series. You would know which part if you're listening to all of them. And I know one guy who has. That's the guy that's with me today. Say hello, guy. Hey, everybody. Everybody, hey. (laughs) It's Craig Moorhead, your co-host of the Never Heard of It podcast. Craig, how are you today? I'm fine. How are you, Sean? I'm feeling good, man. I'm I'm excited. We watched two uh, kind of horror movies, and you know, it feels like it's uh, getting me ripe in the mood for the upcoming season of fall, and to get into October. My daughter's already asking, uh, with tears involved today, to put out Halloween stuff. Oh. So uh, this was a nice little precursor to the season that is ahead of us. Agreed. Yeah, it was nice to watch a couple uh, scary movies. I definitely mm-hmm. can say I felt more engaged with these movies than maybe the others that we've watched so far in uh, in our 1985 series. Now, is that because you don't have a personal connection to machine guns and murder? Well, no, I do, actually. And I feel like having that connection is what drives me more toward uh, the escapism of vampires. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man, that's fun. Well, hey, if you're not quite caught up, here's what we're doing. We're talking about movies from 1985, continuing our series, and uh, it's it's a year that just, just doesn't stop. We're barely into it here, and we're talking about Fright Night and Once Bitten today. I'm going to mention a couple others, but we're going to m- focus mainly on those. If you've been skipping the little mini episodes between, go back and listen to those at some point because we're hitting the trivia and the details and all the little nuggets, behind the scenes stuff, actor connections, director connections for these movies and those. And uh, I'm kind of loving those episodes, man. Those are fun to sit in. It's like just listening to IMDb, but in a good way. Mm. It is a different era of filmmaking, so there's no shortage of stories with these films. Craig, why don't you tell the people where they can go find us online. Well, if you have a Wi-Fi connection, or just an internet connection, I should say. So uh, a dial-up? Yeah, you can have any kind of, as long as you can get on the information superhighway. I don't know, you can, if you bing uh, neverheardofitpodcast.com, or (laughs) neverheardpodcast.com, you can't find us. That's what I'm trying to tell you. (laughs) We can't be found. But yep. if you if you Runners do if you go to web crawler and you look for neverheardpodcast.com Jesus you'll find our site and from there you can find our twitters our instagrams our facebook we're on every we're on every plat we're not on snapchat but more or less we're on every every other um social media thing we're not on tumblr we're only on a few we're on twitter we're on Instagram and we're on Facebook. And the YouTube. ones that matter. Yeah. Because we're there. Exactly. That's why they matter. We're there. That's where the party is. Come to the party. Well, we're going to party today hard. We're definitely doing spoilers. Obviously, these movies have been out for a long time, but because people have posted that uh, they never got around to watching Once Bitten, mm-hmm. it is streaming on. Hulu and Amazon Prime, I believe. Yeah. So no excuse. Go find it, check it out, and uh, revisit this one. Uh, you might want to do it before we talk about it because we might be crashing some of your dreams. I didn't know that so many of you held that movie so fun, yeah, <laughs> so fondly in your memory banks. But uh, we'll see when we get to that. For that matter, you can do a double feature with uh, Fright Night right now. They're on the same. You just load yeah. them up back to back. Get it all done in one evening. I also really appreciated the fact that you posted uh, some video from the Fright Night video game. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'm assuming was that uh, NES? You know what? I don't I don't know. I, I want to say yeah, that I actually somewhere it was that. saying something like Atari. I mean, it was 1988. I'm not sure where NES was at that point. Yeah. No, NES was definitely going strong. Okay. Um, so it could be. You know what? I have a little emulator thing. Thank you, Heath Michaels. I'll go check it out and see if I can play that game and report back. Because it did not look very fun. No, it looked really boring. <laughs> and I was looking for a trailer to put up because I was gonna, you know, I was gonna try and hype this every day. 
until mm-hmm. the thing. And and then when I saw that, all I could think was, I mean, that game came out three years after the movie came out. So it came out right. pretty much the same time as the, the sequel came out. Uh-huh. And the sequel, no one went to go see the sequel. I feel like everyone had forgotten about Fright Night. And then you had that game. I kind of wish I had like that game and like that, that famous E.T. game that's yeah. so bad. Well, you know, eBay might be your friend there. Maybe. Oh, but it may not be your friend. It may cost a lot of money. I don't know <laughs> what the my market enemy. rate is for these games. Indeed. Um, well, I, I actually wanted to start today's episode by talking about two movies that we didn't watch. <laughs> Good. And that is because, you know, I'm sitting here watching these thinking, uh, you know what, we, we could have easily uh, paired Teen Wolf into this discussion sure. today. Now, obviously, I suspect most people have seen Teen Wolf, and, uh, you know, maybe there's not a whole lot to uncover or even revisit there, but... You know, that said, maybe we will get around to checking it out again at some point. We're not going to be able to watch all these damn things. But sure, I, I think, uh, especially with Once Bitten, it's like, oh yeah, okay. This would fall in line with, with that movie a little bit. And then the other one was Transylvania 6 5000, which we talked about a little bit just in our opening episode, I believe, mm-hmm. for this series. And... You know, that's another kind of movie that played off the horror comedy thing. It starred Jeff Goldblum and Ed Bigley Jr. You also got Carol Kane, Jeffrey Jones, Gina Davis, Michael Richards, Kramer. I mean, that's who I remembered distinctly from watching this as a kid. Now, I watched that movie a lot, probably more than uh, a lot of these other ones that we're going to talk about in the series for some reason. And yet, I don't know. I feel like it may get lost in the shuffle of our discussions and and that if I watched it again, it might prove to be terrible. <laughs> it, it certainly did not do well at the box office, but I wanted to bring it up because I was looking at the Wikipedia page today. And in case we don't get to talk about it, I found something that is kind of fascinating here, Craig. Mm-hmm. So Wikipedia says that Transylvania 6 5000, A, which was a pun on a Glenn Miller song called Pennsylvania. I think six five thousand. Yes. Do you know that song? I do, in fact. Is that like a really well known? Because I was like, why? Oh, that, that seems well, like a weird thing to make a pun on. Unless I'm just the only person that doesn't know this damn thing. I'll be honest with you. I think the only reason I know about that Glenn Miller song is because I saw Transylvania six five thousand in the theater. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I don't know how exactly I came across it. I definitely remember it because the chorus is the whole band saying Pennsylvania six, 5,000. And, and you know, okay. That sounds familiar. And yeah. it's, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's maybe not one of his best known songs, but I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's up well, there, but I can say for sure when I saw the movie, I had no idea there was a reference. Like I didn't, I yeah, didn't have any real, idea what Transylvania six, 5,000 was supposed to mean. That's an inside gag, but yeah. uh, no, listen to this. Okay. So this movie was financed by the Dow chemical company. And they said that is a company that is rarely associated with filmmaking, as you might suspect. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Yugoslavia law at the time, which is where they filmed this, prevented the company from repatriating funds that had accumulated in their currency. I guess either doing export-import or whatever the case may be. Uh, But to free these frozen funds, Dow decided to use them to pay for a movie production inside the country. Wow. And that's all they have? And man, I am dying to know more about that. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to have to watch this one again for sure. Also, if there's anyone from Dow listening, if you got some frozen funds in another country, uh, Craig and I are available for hire. We'll <laughs> yeah, be you know happy how to, find to make us. your movie. I yeah. mean, I don't want to go someplace where we're going to die. Just, be, you know, because this podcast sure. needs to continue. Yeah. Right? Like if it's in the North Carolina dollar. Oh man, Special. it's different. Yeah, you know, it's like those those state quarters. Mm-hmm. Like if if that's all they have is just this money in state quarters. Yeah, let's we we'll do, do that for sure. Absolutely, we'll take it. All right. With that aside, I I think we should talk about Fright Night first. What do you think? Let's fright it up. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Uh, I want to start by asking you if you've seen the sequel, because I have not. <sighs> yes, Sean, I've seen the sequel. You say that with a tinge of disappointment in your voice. Is it is it bad, or are you just disappointed in me for asking you that? Oh question? no no, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not sighing because it's bad. I shouldn't be sighing really. For okay. some reason, when you ask me that question, and I flash back to the '80s. I just pictured myself on a couch doing nothing but on like a Friday night with (laughs) a bunch of tapes that I rented and that being one of them. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And I was super excited. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's not nearly as good as the first one. I can say that for sure. But, uh, but it's, it's, it's no slouch. It has a lot of good makeup in it. Cool. Well, there's a lot of good makeup in this one and we'll get to that for sure. Uh, If you're not familiar with the movie, it is a simple synopsis. When a teenager learns that his next-door neighbor is a vampire, no one will believe him. And uh, that's from IMDb, and that feels pretty apt here and kind of all you really need to know. And that's actually one of the things that I most appreciated about watching this movie again Mm -hmm. was that it wastes very little time in establishing all of that. Yeah. And uh, it it hits the ground running, and, and I really liked that. I don't know. I mean, we we definitely don't need to do beat for beat plot with this movie. No. I think a lot of the fun of it is just in the characters and that very sort of simple what if that it's playing off of the sort of suburban fears of uh, the uh, the bad neighbor moving in, which I think pops its head up uh, all over the place in the eighties. Sure. The burbs. Yeah. Kind of poltergeist is kind of the reverse of that, I guess, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I think you could argue Teen Wolf is is fitting in there. Sure. There's a little bit of uh, country mouse, city mouse, not country mouse, but sur- suburb mouse, city mouse right. going on in Once Bitten. But uh, you know, it's definitely a prevalent theme mm-hmm. and one that I appreciate and enjoy, and I think is a lot of fun. Let's talk about a. I'm just very curious to know, like, what you thought watching it again for probably. The, I'm sure it's what the 1100th time. Yeah, um, uh, still holding up strong for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I watched this one by myself this time. No one was there to accompany me. No. And uh, hey, yeah. just like back in back in 1988. Right? Oh yeah, just like 1988 <laughs> through uh, 2005. Mm-hmm. No, um, the. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's it's definitely one of those sort of seminal movies of my childhood. It was one of the it was one of the first movies that was uh, uh, it was a sanctioned rental by my parents. Ah. So I was like actually allowed to watch this one. Yes. And yeah, I mean, I I don't know, like it's um, I feel like it really holds up, and I'm sort of surprised at how much it holds up. Um, mm-hmm. I remember thinking a lot about how how everything really looks and feels like a set. Like everything just really feels like a set in really, yeah. in, in a lot of bad ways. Like actually uh, Dandridge's house doesn't feel so much like a set, but like Brewster is just, it, I don't know. It just feels like it's a bunch of flats that they, that they nailed together. It, it really does. The and, neighborhood looks like a lot for uh, sure. Totally like a you lot. You see the backdrop. And yeah. yet I got to say, yeah, it, it, it moves there's there's so much plot like you don't even get to Peter Vincent until like half an hour in or something mm-hmm. like it's um I don't know it's just it's a it's a movie that's just full of goodness and light that's how I feel about it how do you feel about it Sean uh, the same for the most part I have a few little things with the plot that I thought were a little bit clunky but sure. actually I think what's so smart about the movie and and holds up really well is the structure of this movie and kind of how it plays on a just the title of Fright Night and the Peter Vincent show of Fright Night because while yeah you're not really interacting with Peter Vincent until half an hour in mm-hmm. he's in the opening of the movie for the most part oh, because yeah. you know it's doing that sort of same thing that Explorers did a little bit yeah. Which is, you know, you just kind of enter a scene and there's somebody's watching TV and you get to see what's on the TV for a little bit. And it's one of our it's, tropes. Yeah, it's it's a trope. It's what I like, honestly. Like, mm-hmm. I don't mind it. I feel like oh, no. I don't see that a ton anymore. No. I don't know if that's just because we spend so much more time in front of computers now or yeah. or, or what. And like, that's boring. But um, well, no one no one falls asleep with their computer playing a video, I guess. Right. Like, it just doesn't seem seems weird. Yeah, because like the movie opens with uh, what was his name Charlie. Yeah, 
uh, played by William Ragsdale, who I think we forgot to mention was Herman in Herman's Head. Herman's Head, that's right. Yeah, the Fox show, that. yeah. Uh, which is just kind of interesting because Amanda Beers, who we talked about playing Marcy on Married with Children, there's definitely a, oh, that's true. Uh, a mid-'90s Fox TV connection there with her and, and Mr. Ragsdale again. Anyway, so we're, we're in his room, teenage boy. He's making out with a girl. You're kind of hearing them have the discussion about how far they're going to go. Uh, and the TV's on in the background, but... You know, it's just one of those things, like when you, what I was thinking about, I was like, yeah, yeah. you know, was there a draft where it's just, okay, they're making it out, their TV's on in the background, it's some horror movie. You don't ever, there's no point to the TV, right? Right. Uh, it's just on the background. But then, then somebody has to say, well, what if actually the thing that they're watching becomes somehow involved with the plot later on? And it's, and it's, it's things just like, yeah, that is a smart idea, you know, yeah. um, because it makes it, it makes it worthwhile. Like there's a point to it all. Mm-hmm. I think the, like the biggest trick that this movie maybe pulls off is that Chris Sarandon, the vampire, comes to him, you know, and yeah. it's so funny, like the way they do that, because, you know, it's just like he's just, you know, figured out, thinks this guy's a vampire. He thinks he's seen what he's seen and knows that this guy's bad news just from the window of his room and has had that discussion and someone has introduced the idea. Well, oh, you're OK. Like he can't come into your house unless he's invited right. and you get home. And sure shit, what has mom done? She's invited the damn vampire. <laughs> I, I love the mom. Like That's another thing that I want to talk about a little bit, but it's uh, it's something I feel like is missing from today's movies. But just think about, and I think Once Bitten is a little guilty of this. Mm-hmm. Think about how much they could have drawn that out. Is he or yeah. isn't he? As soon as Jerry Dandridge comes over to your house, there's no denying that he knows that you know <laughs> right and uh that's so great because that that's your conflict the rest of the movie yeah. like it's in motion you don't have to waste time and going back and forth and it, like even that synopsis that i read it's not about whether nobody believes him or not right it doesn't matter because he believes it and he's right and yeah. jerry knows this and so that just it buys you so much more fun to be had with the plot then right i think so too i mean that's the thing it's this one has a little better of an engine than once bitten. Yeah. And you know, it it is mainly because of that. It's like he, he knows this impossible thing is happening next door. And I mean, it takes a little while to, to dawn on him exactly what the scope of it is. Yeah. And to get to the point where he feels like he can just tell people, but he definitely starts telling people long before they're ready to believe him. <laughs> yeah, and, which and I it's, like and too. And it's totally yeah. funny, and and watching the reactions and how things shift around him mm-hmm. is great. And then and how he even scares off Peter Vincent, and how Peter Vincent ends up coming back into it is great. Like, yeah, it it, it feels like something that was just has a nice foundation there, and it, and it runs very very well off of it. Here's my one critique of, and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this because it is such a small thing to me. But the only downside of doing that then mm-hmm. is that you sort of have to invent reasons why Jerry just doesn't kill Charlie. And to me, the biggest one that stood out in this movie is, you know, Charlie becomes convinced based off of Jerry's threats that he is going to be killed that evening, or at least Jerry is going to attempt to kill him that evening. Right. Amy and... Stephen Jeffries, lovable, right. heaven oh, help us, jerking evil, off in the evil Ed, <laughs> evil Ed, uh, which we can spend. 20 oh minutes yeah, heaven help him. us. How can I forget about heaven help us? Yeah, I, I yeah. forgot it too. Like yeah, I mean so good. They go to the Peter Vincent character, who is the host of the Fright Night TV show, and are trying to get him to basically do what they can do to falsify. A, I don't know, like a vampire test, basically. Like right. if Peter Vincent says, Charlie, your neighbor is not a vampire, that'll get Charlie to believe it, right? He'll snap right. back into the real world. And so I think there was a phone call with Jerry Dandridge. Peter Vincent asks if they can perform this test, I believe. Yeah. And it's agreed that they'll do it like the next day mm-hmm. or something like that. The next evening. Yes. To me, that was clunky. Because then you have to have Jerry say to his Billy Cole, Jonathan Stark, the the other vampire that lives with him, oh, well, I don't even have to go the 10 yards next door to kill this guy. He'll come to me tomorrow. Right. And to me, that's like, mm, 
that feels like you're a little too precious with your timeline for some reason. Yes. You know? Yeah. It's something, uh, I wish I could credit this correctly, but someone wrote something recently, I think about stranger things where they coined this phrase plot blocking. Yeah. And that's kind of what that feels like. Oh, I've done like, it a thousand like, times. Yeah. yeah. Like there's not really enough reason to do that. Although I would push back a little bit and say, well, if all of these people now are sort of tipped off that you might be a vampire, maybe you do want all four of them to come to your house so that you, you can sure? wipe them out. So then the real problem, and I totally agree with you, like there's in the confrontation Jerry has with Charlie in his house, in his room, which happens before that, doesn't it? It does, yeah. I mean, I, there's no reason for Jerry to stop what he's doing. Like, he he throws the kid around the room, destroys everything in the room. I don't remember why he stopped, yeah. Well, he stopped because... because uh, um, well, he had a cross, right? Or no? Oh, uh, was it? Maybe it was because of the cross. Because Charlie stabs him in the hand with a pencil, which causes ah, so right. much of a problem. I don't really understand why that, that caused such a problem, but... Yeah, maybe he did pull out a cross, and then and then the mom is like, "Charlie, is that you?" And then yeah, he gets spooked and leaves. And I'm just kind of like, but "You're a vampire." I feel like you could probably do more than that. But yeah, uh, the fact though that when this fake test comes to be, that he does not wipe them all out while they're in his house, having gone there willingly, mm -hmm. that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It seems like all the cards are in his favor. I just don't understand why he wouldn't kill everyone and take Amy for himself. I think it's it's one of those things that they could have ironed out a little bit and perhaps in the process would have added to the length and slowed down the entire experience. Mm -hmm. I could see the version where it, it Jerry is like legitimately not wanting to be discovered. Sure. And so he's very cautious about his steps. But that doesn't jibe with the fact that, like, literally the first time Charlie sees these guys, which is in the opening of the movie, they're carrying a coffin into the house. Right. <laughs> and then a dead body out, which is great. I mean, that's that adds so much suspense when you do it that way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're not being that cautious. And, like, yeah, he bears his fangs with the window open with the topless lady uh, yeah. that he's brought into the house, you know without like checking to see if the neighbor might be a horny teenage kid next door with a pair of binoculars. Right. Um, Who's like, I mean, 20 feet away. Yeah. And, and, but also the, the, the young lady who goes topless for that scene seemed to be like just looking right at Charlie the whole time. She did. Yeah. It's a little conflicting as far as the info there. Yeah. But again, I don't know. I didn't mind it. I mean, I think some of that is like part of the vampire mystique of just the ultimate power of seduction. You know, sure. it's like maybe she's in a bit of a trance and they play a little bit off of that with the mom, which is great. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think those are really minor quibbles. I, I think, sure. you know, I never bored with this movie. It moves so well. There's some good surprises. I think you know, maybe you could argue that the final climax is is drawn out a little bit. And what what do you think about the using the sort of ticking clock of sunrise as something that would surprise a vampire and, well, and contribute to its demise? Um, I mean, it works enough. I think the the thing I that so. I don't like about it is sort of my own assumptions. But it's like when they go to the house, like it doesn't feel like it's that late at night. Like once they go to the house that night, there's not a big passage of time that's cut They're out. They're not there it. for, yeah, eight hours. For like it's like 15, 20 minutes, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. So did they just, did they go over there at like 545? And then, mm -hmm. you know, because wouldn't you go in the, well, you wouldn't want, well, I, I don't know. It's a cheat, I it, think. It, it's It's kind of a cheat. It does seem like, yeah, like the vampire would not be, caught off guard about that when it's literally something that could easily kill him like would yeah. he jump through his gigantic stained glass window breaking it just letting any kind of light in he did have all those alarm clocks or cuckoo clocks and stuff which is maybe cool. maybe we can consider that another trope considering that uh back to the future has a very similar 
ah, sort of bit. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. But but that being said, I like the drawn out ending of this. Mm-hmm. I kind of like the fact that it goes on so long, and I and I realize, or at least maybe it's just in my heart, I think that it's drawn out so that they can have more effects so that Jerry can get spooked by the sun and then he can turn yeah. into a crazy bat and then he can fly into the thing where he can have burn makeup on and then Amy can have her makeup and they can run around in the, in the basement. Like there's no real reason to do all that. Like there's no reason he couldn't just die at the top of those stairs. Yeah. And then Amy's fine. But, but yeah, I mean, I personally, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm like, yeah, just keep, keep going with this ride. Yeah, and I mean, I think the makeup's great. I mean, it's yeah. it's really good stuff. None of it looks silly uh, 30 no. years later, which is, you know, impressive. And Evil Ed, I got to say, because uh, I was a big Fangoria reader around okay. this time. And that so, had to show up heavily in there, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I saw yeah. tons of photos of it. And that, it was always kind of the thing when I was a kid. It was kind of neat because, like, I'd, you know, I'd... I'd see the all the stuff in this ma- like all the movies in this magazine or everything i want to be watching and i only get to see like maybe a couple things because my folks aren't going to let me rent a lot of this stuff right mm-hmm. but i see all these pictures and they're like burned into my memory so whenever i finally see it it's like it's kind of like i don't know like the the universe kind of aligns in a weird way you know <laughs> like i say yeah. oh that guy he's gonna be in the thing and that's one of those is the evil evil ed with the uh red wig on when he's mm-hmm. in charlie brewster's mom's bed yeah. Charlie Brewster, like that shot of him with the the crazy teeth and like the cross thing burned into his forehead and all that stuff. Where did he like, get that, that wig was... too? By the way, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. My first thought was that's a mop, and then I was like, wait, there yeah, are no red mops. I know it's so weird and funny. Yeah, a random it's, choice. It's really bizarre, but man, that guy. And can we talk for a second? Just just jumping around. Can we just talk for a second about the evil Ed scene where he is turned? Evil Ed is just a weirdo through the oh, yeah. whole thing. Like his voice, his vibe is so bizarre. It just, it kind of is always knocking you off balance a little bit. As yet, Charlie, police have no leads. But you would have heard on the police band last night? That wasn't the only murder. The second in two days. And get this. Both of them had their heads chopped off. <laughs> Can you believe it? You're sick. <laughs> let me uh, let me ask you a question. Yeah. And just are he and Charlie friends? <laughs> yeah, it seems like it seems like Evil Ed is his only friend, but at the same and time, yet... Charlie also doesn't doesn't seem to like him. I and know they, they seem so... to really rag each other really hard. Like they they don't seem to have a friendship history. Right. Yeah. I mean, me and my friends at that age, for sure, like just the vilest stuff we would say to one another. Sure. But it, it in my head, it seemed more playful. But I don't know, maybe somebody looking from a distance, like, why wow, these guys hate each other? That's true. Uh, but yeah, the, and there's a few little moments where I think they get comedy out of that too. Though I remember, you know, when they're walking home, Evil Ed decides he's going to go down the alley, and Charlie goes, "Where are you going, pencil dick?" Yeah. And um, which hey, is just a good line, right? It is pencil dick Especially works in, the, in almost in the, every. Yeah. yeah, and in a tense moment, in you know a horror movie essentially. But Stephen Jeffries, Evil Ed, he looks, he takes a beat and looks at his own crotch, then laughs, then says, "Home," you know, so I'm going home, mm-hmm. and it's just such a weird. I mean, that is such a weird reaction to have to that oh, line. Yeah. It's such a funny way to play it, mm-hmm. but. uh yeah, I was. The transition is really fascinating to watch, and then we should talk about his death scene as well because I thought that was pretty amazing too. But oh yeah, yeah wh- when he turns, what were you? Well, it's just again he he's been such a weirdo. Mm-hmm. Everything's a joke, and then you have like this thirty second bit where Jerry Dandridge corners him in this alley, and he's like, he's basically like, no one, no one's gonna bully you anymore. No yeah. one's gonna. No one's going to, like, beat you up because cause if they do, they have to answer to me. Like, that kind of thing. And, like, Evil Ed gets, like, tears in his eyes. And I remember oh, even so as a sad. kid, I was kind yeah. of, like, really moved by that. I was like, oh, my God. Like, it just suggests this whole undercurrent of Evil Ed that otherwise you don't really see. Like, there's not, yeah. he you know. And it just, like, instead of just having a vampire grab him and bite his neck, 
it's like oh it's so evil it's just yeah. like yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna take your hand i'm gonna do this like i'm mm-hmm. i'm terrified but at the same time like you're saying all the things that i really want release from like it's i don't know it, it really it really kind of gets me well and i think that is actually i think that's part of why this movie holds up well uh additionally is because they are sort of keeping with sort of the classic vampire mythology that even like me this like total horror layperson sure knows and it's just like a given and this idea that it you know it, yeah there's there's power attached to being a vampire and mm-hmm. immortality and um this weird like self confidence that is seductive so to see it play out in that moment with this weirdo evil Ed guy who, yeah, I'm, I'm not even sure is Charlie's friend. Like, I don't know like yeah. what role he really fulfills in this thing. It's great. It's a good reminder that we should be afraid of Jerry Dandridge, not just because of the fact that he's wearing false teeth, right? You know, thanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and again, like we'll get to this with once bitten, but that is, it is so totally missing from that movie. And I think that's yeah. a, a big big reason why it doesn't hold up that well here you know it's like you don't question the like the vampire mythology is intact um all that stuff is there and uh i thought it was cool yeah i i made note of that as well though it's just like he really sold that moment in that performance which is so unexpected for that character yeah (laughs) it's great yes it's a great great touch i think the same thing kind of happens when peter vincent kills him well Maybe he's not dead. Maybe that's the very end of the movie. I don't know. Yeah, we we need to talk about that because that is easily my yeah. least favorite part of the movie. Yeah, but, I, I think so. But in that moment where Peter Vincent drives, and I can't remember how they got separated exactly, or that was back at Peter Vincent's apartment, wasn't it? The evil Ed shows up. Evil Ed, yeah, first, yeah. He shows up and that's when Peter Vincent like burns the cross into his forehead. Yeah. Yeah. But when does he when does he drive the stake through him? Is that at Jerry's? That's a, at, at Charlie's. That's a Charlie's, Charlie's okay, house. Okay, next door. Yeah, because okay. Peter Vincent runs out of the other place, yeah. out of Jerry Dandridge's house, and uh, and into the you know to get Charlie's mom, mm-hmm. and then finds. That's right. But finds it's him. so, so yeah. sad. Oh my god! Like he oh, yeah, just no. you know, this poor guy, Peter Vincent, and like again, like Roddy McDowell is like a really good performance there. Yeah, you're just sort of watching this kid. He's a kid. Yeah, die in front of you because you had no choice but self defense. And I think that's a moment where you're probably absolutely right. That was done strictly for the purpose of showing the various stages of transition with the makeup. But they made it emotional. Like, they made it work, I think. They sold it. Well, that's the thing. Because Peter Vincent is the great vampire killer. But, of course, he's never killed anything in his life. Oh, yeah. And so here he is, like, kind of presiding over just that great bit where uh, Evil Ed is, like, reaching his hand out to mm-hmm. him and and peter vincent almost takes his hand and then like stops and and he's just he he has no idea what to do he's just completely freaked out um because he's watching somebody die and then uh, yeah and then yeah, and, and then he takes the stake and then he's kind of a changed guy he's like okay we have to kill these things like we have yeah. to keep this from happening to anyone else kind of uh, that's actually a really interesting way of looking at that yeah that's got to be a weird thing to perform as the actor right yeah, well, yeah, to think, to imagine that you're on set and <laughs> there's no music, there's nothing intense, and you just have like 40 people standing around watching you. Yeah. And you're just shaking and like, yeah, it, it's kind and of. And half weird. of them are just watching to make sure the makeup looks right and it's not getting messed oh, yeah. up and, you know, that they can do another take. Yeah. And then you're naked by the end of it. Oh, you're totally naked. A buck ass naked. But then, yeah, I mean, the, that process, I didn't read up on that particular scene, but I, I assume that process had to take, I don't know, days? Yeah. Because it's a lot of makeup, and then you have to sort of be subtracting from it, or else you you shot everything in reverse, and you're adding to it. I don't know. Yeah, a lot a lot went into that, man. I mean, this this was this was like the prime time for those it really transformation, was. like effects and stuff in in horror movies it was great like you you just you could just sink your teeth into that stuff or in michael jackson's thriller too you know for that matter well let's talk about then about evil ed's reappearance there at the very end and maybe we can uh, close the book on evil ed for a little bit and talk about some other things but yeah I, i wonder i don't know man maybe you know more about the horror thing like where like this idea got started where you have your sort of false ending and then you get your one little scare factor at the very end 
to suggest well, that one monster's not as dead as they thought he was. Yeah. I mean, I I can't speak with all authority. Sure. But you I'll, can make I'll, an educated guess. I'll, de- I'll definitely, well, I feel like it goes maybe back to, at least, back to 1976, uh, Carrie. So Carrie ends with a dream sequence of one of the girls from the high school, like going to Carrie's grave uh-huh. and putting some flowers on the grave and then Carrie's hand coming out of the grave and that's grabbing right. that girl's hand. And then she wakes up from the thing and that's pretty much it. And then it's, you know, credits after that. And at the time, like that, that scare works very well because yeah. it's pointing out that this girl who experienced all this stuff that uh, she's kind of on the sidelines of everything Carrie was going through and saw the, you know, massacre that happened at the prom and all that stuff. She's messed up. And yeah. she's going to be messed up. And that's kind of mm-hmm. the point of that. And then I feel like you also had stuff like Halloween where it was going to end with Michael Myers being dead. But then the, the the producers were like, well, let's just have, you know, his body's not there at the end. So we could do a sequel later if we wanted to. And so they don't have yeah. the body there at the end. Then it's like, okay, it's sequel time. And I feel like that's more what this is. You kind of have your last little jolt, be. but you also have, oh, there might be a sequel. But in this case, it doesn't make any sense. Or at least no. it doesn't make sense with Evil Ed's voice. Yeah. Like have the red eyes there. That's great. Because you're like, well, who's that? Is there somebody else we forgot? And then you can address that in the sequel. That's fine. But you have Evil Ed say it and you're like, but it doesn't make sense at all because he's been staked and the guy who turned him is also dead. So in no way should Evil Dead be a vampire at this point. Right. Like it doesn't, there's no logic you can kind of get to. So yeah, so that ending was has always sort of just been like, oh, it kind of just f- falls pretty flat. Yeah, it's also, you know, the way that they did it is that the eyes are right outside the window of Charlie's bedroom again, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I think they were in the house. Well, they're, okay, well, they're, well, they're even worse. Like how, you know, yeah. oh, <laughs> you're yeah. basically saying that in the sequel, okay, yeah. Well, either this monster will have killed Charlie, uh, mm. and that'll be great, and then or Charlie will have killed this monster. So yeah, it doesn't really matter. And yeah. it's, <laughs> well, it's like I mean, no, like that's about to be a very terrifying life or death scenario if that's indeed a, another vampire right yeah. there. I mean, you can't just end on that. Well, well exactly. Yeah, it's it's. Like yeah, you know, exactly. What what would just stop that red eyed vampire from flying across and just killing, and killing them? Yeah, uh, yeah. There, there's there's a lot of mental real estate, but but also unless I'm completely forgetting something important, part two has nothing to do with those eyes. Has okay. absolutely nothing. It never comes back, and it has no, evil Ed's not in that movie. Like has nothing to do with it. So, uh, but William Ragsdale is, and tr- he plays Charlie again. It says Charlie Brewster and Peter Vincent must face more vampires, which are out for revenge. Was it revenge? Maybe it was revenge. I don't know. But uh, it sounds like even just putting more vampires in the synopsis makes me think. Okay, classic sequel mistake of just yeah. throwing more at the screen. You know? Here's more. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I feel like for some reason in this one it's like. Charlie in the second one, Charlie doesn't believe they're vampires, but Peter Vincent yep. does. Like that, and that seems like that's all the only difference. So, yeah. so it, it did feel kind of tired in that way. Okay. Yeah. Well, what did you think of uh young William Ragsdale as Charlie in this movie? And since we talked about it, you brought it up last time, did you notice uh that he was walking with a cast in in, in your rewatch of this? I never noticed it. Uh, I saw I, one shot where I thought maybe, but it's not. I didn't see it on his leg. Just from the, it was like a medium close, medium shot. Uh, so you're not seeing below the waist, but did just the way he was walking, I was like, hmm, that might have been cast. Maybe, walk. yeah. I, I I kept looking for it, but yeah, I never saw that. And as far as him, like, um, I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to to imagine Fright Night without it being yeah. him. Like his voice, his cadence, like. Same way with Evil Ed. Um, it's For me, it's just hard to imagine it would be anybody else. What about you? I think he's really great in this. I mean, yeah. I think it's one of those, you know, not to pick on the guy, but whoever played Billy and Gremlins. Like, <laughs> I remember watching that yeah. f- a few years ago. It's like, man, that guy just, like, he does not seem scared the entire movie. Right. And like, here, like, I believe it. Like, when, when yeah. Ragsdale is looking out the window... Again, what had to be a set, 
and you know he's gazing in uh, across the street here wondering what the hell just moved in next door uh the fear is real and the comedy is real and yeah, yeah it, it's kind of interesting it's just like one of those roles like especially looking back i'm like and then especially we'll talk comparing it to jim carrey in once bitten mm-hmm. like why didn't this launch this guy into yeah. the sort of Michael J. Fox, not stratosphere, but in the, you know, like next rung down, maybe. Sure. I mean, he could have he could have played Teen Wolf <laughs> easily, right? Sure. I mean, yeah, yeah, that is a good question. Like, and, and I kind of forgot. I mean, he basically went right to Fright Night 2. Yeah, and then a lot of TV stuff, it looks like. I mean, really. And like, yeah, kind Which, of sequels you know. and stuff. Yeah, that is that is interesting why why that would happen that way. Because and, and I agree, you know, for some reason I, I had the same Gremlins, uh, sort of the same Gremlins connection. Oh yeah. Except that I was thinking that he was in Gremlins. Like I I wasn't thinking he was in Gremlins, but I was like, who, if it wasn't him, who was it? And then and then of course uh, yeah. when I saw a picture of the guy, I was like, oh yeah, it was that guy. That guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry, it, that guy. Yeah, that, that guy. Uh, no, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you, you're a fine person. Yeah. But, I mean, but yeah, I mean, William Ragsdale, sake. yeah, I mean, Fright Night needed him. This was a very well cast movie. You know, every movie is not the same. Every movie needs a different cast. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this one, it's, I mean, there's really not a, it's really not a bad choice on the list as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I thought everybody was pretty good. I mean, I enjoyed just the nostalgia factor of watching Amanda Bierce um, because of how much I watched Married with Children. But yeah, you know, she she's fine and she's not bad. And and also, I kind of like that she is in a lot of ways driving the plot to kind of save Charlie, or at least you know make him see that there's no such thing as vampires which feels yeah. like an authentic thing for a girlfriend to do right sure <laughs> you know if you care about the guy well and you know both of these movies are maybe not about but both of these movies really involve some very very understanding girlfriends oh god yeah i'd i'd be hard pressed to think of a anyone <laughs> i ever dated who would have been like really gone through all of this yeah with me the shit would not fly in 2017, I'm sure. Oh, man. I, I mean, once bitten, not. there's no question. There's not yeah. a single person I dated who would have nope. been like, oh, that's fine. Done. Did you notice that uh, Amanda Bierce, in her transition, and it wasn't completely clear to me exactly what was going on with her in regards to the time that it took from Jerry biting her to whenever she kind of turned into a vampire... She took on the uh, resemblance of Marilyn Monroe. Did you notice that? How her hair grew out? Her hair grew out and went blonder, and she's yeah. wearing that white dress that sort of... Yeah, and I, I didn't really understand that. I mean, it, it's kind of like, obviously, he, Jerry, dressed her in that outfit, because you get that awesome scene right. where he's making out with her on the rug. It's so gross. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. Making out uh, on rugs. Have you? Uh, serious of the personal fireplace. question. Have you ever made out on a rug in front of a fireplace? I don't think so. Yeah. I, I never kiss and tell. So. Hey man, <laughs> I heard that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. She she does. She <laughs> really does. Like her whole countenance is different, and you you might be able to make the argument that maybe she's kind of changing a little bit into the woman in the painting, but that's not true because she already yeah. looks just like that person in the painting. Uh huh. So I never understood that. I, I also thought a little of the Sigourney Weaver kind of transition in Ghostbusters a little bit, which I, I don't sure. know why. What exactly made me think of that? But it did. Um, I mean, that's. I think that's apt. I mean, they they both sort of become like yeah. super ultimate seductresses. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I thought but, she but was why, good. Yeah, why? Roddy why McDowell Garrett was good. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I didn't quite have a good feel for the Billy Cole character played by Jonathan Stark only because I wasn't sure if he knew no well obviously he knew that Chris Sarandon was a vampire but I was not clear that he was a vampire until the final act of the movie he wasn't a vampire was he oh wait a second see I always thought he was like (laughs) he I, I always thought he was essentially a ghoul Okay. And maybe maybe this is just yeah, maybe this is just like getting into the weeds a little bit. But wait, um, he got 
Didn't he get shot by Peter Vincent, though? And then he gets back up. But he does get staked. Right? Let's let's clear this up right now. Okay. Is Billy Cole a vampire? Vampire servant. Vampire servant is someone who has been bitten by a vampire and made his loyal protector. So, essentially, he uh, is a vampire. Okay. He's like the Clavon little yeah, of this movie. of this movie. I didn't mind the character. I just thought that was, yeah, it was a little unclear to me, like... What's this guy's deal? Because like, there was a part where I was watching this thinking, man, it'd be interesting to do a remake from his POV. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what's this guy's deal? Like, How did he end up just being Chris Sarandon's well, yeah. manservant for 100 years or whatever? <laughs> I kind of I want to, yeah, I kind of wanted that scene where he's just in the house by himself like, man, fuck this shit. Yeah. It's like, God, God damn it. Damn coffins Sucks around. This whole clocks. house fucking covered in spider webs. We got to move every six weeks. I'm sick of it, Jerry. I'm sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I did like, like I, f- I felt like he was his just his look, uh, and maybe Evil Ed did too to a certain extent. But I felt like his look dated the movie the most for me. Like I kept it looking at did. everybody, and I was like, I was like, Chris Sarandon, you could almost look exactly that way in a movie right now, as far as I'm concerned. Like bit, if yeah. he still looked that way, he could walk. You know, Amanda Beer is pretty much the same thing. Ragsdale the same thing Roddy McDowell's in a ton of makeup but like I kind of still see it whereas like just his hair like he's the only one who looks like he's of the era of, of the 80s to me like he I just think, stepped onto the set yeah like no makeup I'm gonna I gotta do my part I think that's fair but it also like it just clicks then I think when you watch it as you know children of the 80s you're like oh yeah that dude's a dick yeah you just know <laughs> like yeah he's yeah. gonna be a pain in the ass uh, but this this movie and Once Bitten as well, I think you know yes, they don't look as dated. Uh, Amanda Bierce and William Ragsdale, the teenage couple in this movie, but they always they never look like teenagers to me. Like Stephen Jeffries is the only oh, yeah, guy in this no. movie that looks like an actual teenager. You know? Yeah. Uh, when Ragsdale, yeah, when Ragsdale is with his mom, he's like, "Mom," I'm like, "Dude, you're you're almost thirty. Yeah. But in a weird way, I feel like that's true in general, though. Of of like movies in the eighties to oh, now, yeah. you can certainly see like this continuum where like the teenagers then were definitely thirty year olds and now you you kinda have to be a teenager. Otherwise people mm-hmm. are like, Don't even come near my teenager movie. Yeah. But go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say I love the mom. Like I love her, like ask I can't remember what Charlie's saying, but something about the neighbor next door and vampires or whatever. And she's like, Do you need a Valium to help you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> like that's I'm telling you, yeah. like clueless parents. It was such a great eighties thing mm-hmm. that we've gotten away from it. It's so depressing to me. Like I feel like now, you know, and I know they re- remade this movie. I saw it. And I really liked it, actually. Uh, I don't know. We, I gotta we should check it out. I never get saw into it. that. I thought it was good, man. There's, so, I don't remember what they did with the mom character in that one, but I feel like you know, there's, there's these movies that they come out and it's like they can't just be clueless. They gotta have some sort of like arc, and right. you know, they gotta have some depth. We gotta make sure that they care about their kids, and then they're not too loose with their parenting skills. Otherwise, people won't like them, and we can't get a name actor to play the part. And if we get a name actor yeah. to play the part, then we got to give them like ten more minutes of real estate. It's like no, none of that. Like the mom in this is perfect. She's in it for the like the perfect amount of screen time. <laughs> yeah, she's the perfect amount of clueless, and like that's yeah, that's what you feel as a teenager in a lot of ways. Anyway, so it's it it just makes sense. Like just play into that and have fun with it. And uh, I miss that. I definitely miss that. Yeah. Did you notice uh, or pay attention to the diss at Friday the 13th in this movie? Oh, yeah. Peter Vincent uh, dismissing movies about people in ski masks. Hacking up versions. And I would point out, Peter Vincent, that it's hockey masks. You're right. I, I mean, honestly, at, at this point, it's perfect. Um, it, yeah. Because it's know. true, it, right? Because it's true. It's true. Yeah. Like, you're, you're, just, you're, you're tired. You, you don't like that stuff. You're from a different era. Like, I, I, I love the whole idea of Peter Vincent's character. I like the fact that he has that whole character mm-hmm. like this, this washed up actor who wanted to be so much more. And he looks back on what he did and he doesn't think it's that great. And he just such a good, such a good role. Yeah. And did you think about how much the plot of this movie as it pertains to him resembles the plot of a bug's life? I can honestly say I never thought about that, <laughs> but apparently well, it kind of does. Wow. It kind of yeah. does. I, I, I don't even remember the plot of bug's life. I'll be honest with you. Well, I'll tell you. Please. Dave Foley plays an ant 
Their little colony is in trouble because they're being picked on by the grasshoppers, Kevin Spacey. Grasshopper. So he goes out to find warrior bugs. And instead, he finds a group of circus actors oh. and hires them instead. But he thinks that they're actual warrior bugs, right? Sure. Not sure. just actors. So, I don't know. I mean, there's something to be had with playing off of the ego of actors. It's always fun when you oh, do absolutely. it like this. Well, and that's the thing. Like, I was kind of trying to figure out, like, how how meta was this movie you know mm -hmm. like once you kind of start bringing hollywood into it then it's kind of you know you're and you're shooting on such an obvious back lot and and all that kind of stuff like uh it's not as obvious as it would be now yeah if it was meta now it would just be you just open your guts and like you'd see the camera in a mirror and both of these movies kind of take shots at themselves i feel like yeah for sure uh which is interesting now let me say this uh at the risk of transitioning too soon. Well, I got one question. In... Oh, go please. About do. Fright Night. Question. You number. just made me think of it when you said something about mirror. There's a pretty good no reflection shot in Fright Night. Yes, there is. Any thoughts on how they did that one? I was trying to figure it out. Yeah. I, I it, it might have been a double. I was also thinking was it a was it an animation of some kind? Interesting. Like it's it seemed very steady to be you know, the shot just kind of pasted in there. Mm -hmm. Well, we have, we have a few really good shots of that. But the one that I think was the best was Chris Strand walking across the room. Yeah. And mainly because, and I think this is probably true of every time I've watched the movie because I don't watch it that often. And I forget about this. I don't even notice that he's not showing up in the re reflection until he opens the door. And then I'm like, oh, point. shit. That's, yeah, that's the reflection. And it's 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 really well done. And yeah, there's a lot of is. like there's a lot in Once Bitten, and there are a few other times in Fright Night where it's not that well done. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier about the effects guy Steve Johnson. He had just worked on Ghostbusters. They had apparently the effects crew from Ghostbusters on Fright Night, and on Ghostbusters they had been doing a lot of a lot of these kind of plates and stuff. So I'm thinking that that mm. mirror may have been a plate. They like they yeah. may have found a very steady way to do that and figured out all the the kinks to that to really make it work because it that's, really works like it doesn't give itself away it's pretty yeah, great that's a good uh possibility uh, this is one of those movies i would be fascinated in uh, the commentary yeah uh yeah. which i think exists i think there's a commentary at least on the dvd i especially would love to know about the makeup and all that kind of stuff well i'm sure i have my issue of fangoria well yeah i would say let's send me that in the mail <laughs> Yeah. If it's not too crusty. Wait, what do you think I do with those? Well, I don't, you know, just crusty over time. Not, you know, oh, nothing, sure. Like, okay. Unnatural. Okay. God. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you were practicing, like, your own sort of makeup effects. Uh, I should have. With that in mind, let's talk one spitting. Pause for music interlude. And I was going to try and bridge these two with the dance sequence. Well, that's funny because you know what my very first note that I took on this movie was? What's that? There's a choreographer on this movie, dot, dot, mm -hmm. dot. Because <laughs> I noticed that in the opening credits. And yeah. that, that just made me go, hmm, is that like a stunt choreographer, fight choreographer? Right. Or is that like a choreographer, choreographer? Choreographer. And it was the latter, it turns out. Yeah. So, so you know, so both movies have these dance sequences one mm -hmm. in which Amanda Bierce is seduced by Chris Sarandon. And it's that itself is quite good. It also had a choreographer. It starts off very funny to me. It's very funny, but it's also kind of creepy because yeah. Chris Sarandon starts way back on the dance floor, way back in the crowd, and he's kind of going back and forth like a shark in water uh -huh. and they'll cut to Amanda Bierce walking closer and then they cut back to Chris Thrain and he crosses the other way and he's closer and they just do this I don't know like 180 times and then suddenly he's right beside her mm -hmm. and that bit works so well for me it's great <laughs> like yeah. just as a like the whole it's it's like funny and scary at the same time and anyway they dance and she's totally seduced by him um, I don't know if Naturally. there's much more to say about that except it's, nope. it's a pretty great little sequence and I did think Whereas, it was odd that he yeah. 
he gets really mad at the security guard, right? <laughs> and like that, he he does not do much to protect his cover as a as a vampire. No, in that club. No, he he definitely gives it away. Yeah, kind of does make you wonder. Yeah, I mean, there were just there were there were things like that in the movie. There's no yeah. there's no doubt about it. Things yeah. that if you were really trying to hide your uh, identity or like just murder someone, you would just have done it a different sure. way. And at the risk of, of diving too far into Once Bitten, there's also yeah. a dance sequence here. It owes a little more maybe to Grease. Yeah. <laughs> and it's completely, I mean, it's so choreographed and yeah. bonkers and doesn't make any sense, really. But I None. guess it fits in with sort of the campiness of the movie. Kind of. But, but, but you know, the, the, the core of our movie Once Bitten is that there's a vampire in L.A. played by Lauren Hutton who needs virgin blood to stay looking young. Mm-hmm. And, of course, it's 1985 in L.A., so there aren't a lot of virgins. She <laughs> finds one in Jim Carrey. Yeah. And that dance sequence is between her and Jim Carrey and Jim Carrey's girlfriend who is fighting for him. Yes. And we'll Ooh, get I think to... I mispronounced her name in the previous episode. I think it's oh. Karen Copens. I said Karen something Cohen. else, but apologies okay. to her. That was Correction Corner. Yes, Correction Collection. Sean Harwell. Yes, it's, oh, it's adding up nice. over here in the corner. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's our movie. Now, again, I guess not to go beat by beat, but maybe let's start with Sean. I, was, I personally was surprised at how funny parts of the movie still were to me. How, how did you feel about that? Comedy wise, I will agree with you. There are parts that are definitely funny. To me, it was interesting to watch it because it's it's impossible to to separate the Jim Carrey that we know from the Jim Carrey that nobody knew really at yeah. the time of this. So I I was watching it and laughing at, at bits and thinking, oh, this makes so much sense to me why he ended up in the role of. Lloyd in, in Dumb and Dumber, he was Lloyd, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Because of there's like the way he handles naivety and just this sort of like earnest, simple goodness to him, to this guy in some ways, even though he does some not good things. Mm-hmm. And so that stuff I really liked. And then actually the dance off, which is, again, it's a ridiculous thing to say that there's a dance off in the vampire. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> but there is it is a dance off it is a contest mm-hmm. for this man in fact the song playing is about that anyway yeah. that's one of the only moments in the movie well that and then there's a sequence in a uh in the like clothing store that the, the girlfriend works in where you really see any sort of like the physical comedy side of jim carrey i thought yeah and yeah it's hard not to look at it and think, ah, oh, sh- like I wish they would just let him off the leash a little bit more, or maybe he yeah. just wasn't confident at the time to kind of do that sort of stuff. And you know, you could sure. argue the movie doesn't need it story wise, but I think yeah. com- comedy wise, it, it definitely could have, like, they could have taken it up a notch for my taste for sure. For sure. But the biggest problem I had with this movie was it had nothing to do with the comedy. It was just all the other, like, just the completely non threatening vampire aspect of yeah. this thing. Uh, it's just not even close to being a concern. I mean, really, like no. there's like if I met these these vampires in the street, I feel like I could handle myself against them. Like, <laughs> and that's saying something because, you know, you've seen me. Oh, man. But uh, that that's it. And, you know, I think to me, that's where that's where this movie ends up. Yeah. In the bottom half of the top 100 for this year. And Fright Night doesn't, you know. Yeah. Um, they are very different movies in a lot, a lot of ways of execution. Yeah. And. Uh, I think Fright Night is, is hands down the better movie. Yes. Uh, I, I'm glad to know that there are people that are really nostalgic and really kind of like enjoyed Once Bitten. I think it's yeah, I think it's a really cool thing to watch. I think it's fun to watch. I wasn't really bored. No. There are moments I think they're tedious. The end's kind of tedious. But yeah, I, I laughed. I, I think the characters are, are fun. What's the big sort of comedic engine in this thing for you? Is, is it really is it Jim Carrey's performance or what what was kind of drawing you in comedically? Well, yeah, I mean, he's he's definitely the only thing to me that was really funny. I think there mm-hmm. are some some pretty good throwaway gags. I kind of like that Lauren Hutton pushes down an old lady and a nun. Oh, yeah, twice. Yeah, that was a great. Like, you know, like 
but but all of that stuff still kind of felt like man I'm, we gotta do, we should do something funny in this scene uh yeah because there's nothing down yeah there's yeah, nothing else with just, that character i wish she had been over the time i wish she'd been doing that in every scene like more yeah. of that like yeah or or even you know the other thing i kept thinking was man if if this movie was just moving a little faster maybe that would yeah help. even if it was just a little faster and i wouldn't have to dwell on some of this like yeah i, I don't know but like but like there's a bit at the beginning um but you all okay you also have to get through uh all the gay panic homophobia stuff yeah which, which is we... just gr- gr- grueling yeah and unrepentant it's just it's bad and it makes oh, man. you feel bad and it yeah, really drains a lot is, of fun out of the movie it's tough to watch um, in 2017 yeah but like at the beginning he wants to have sex with his girlfriend common trope they could almost be making fun of the other sex comedies that have come before it it's the same opening as fright night i mean essentially you know oh yeah yeah Yeah. totally just about teenage couple in a car well in a closed you know space wanting to go to that next level those relationships that tells you a lot right there i feel Yeah, about 1985 doesn't it oh man i mean well well just like yeah from from that point jim carrey goes on to have a one night stand with a vampire Mm mm-hmm and then and his girlfriend just basically say eh, it's my fault whereas on fright night side you have these two people who who seem kind of committed to each other and that's yeah. kind of great um which 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 brings in stakes like you don't really care about anyone in the once bitten movie no and and a part of that i think is the tone and probably intentional but i was going to say one of the bits that made me laugh early on you know he he gets out of the car after his girlfriend tells him you know finally like no we're not doing it he gets out of the car and they're just surrounded by other cars where mm-hmm. people are just completely porking oh away. Oh my gosh, yeah. And and it's and it's just this long crane up and like <laughs> Jim's like reaction and I'm just like, man, first of all they lucked out getting Jim Carrey and like that bit worked really well for me. Like that actually made me laugh and and it was very few and far between. Like his two friends, man, that stuff is hard to watch. Like it is yeah. almost none of that stuff and it's not really it's not their fault i don't feel like it's just like the situations they're trying to pick up girls in laundromats and it's just like uh, uh, it's just hard i i think there's i want to dissect a little bit of the opening in that scene in yeah. particular just a little bit more just because even just hearing you talk about it and thinking about it like i have to imagine like on the page that stuff probably killed because i actually wrote down sure. like i think we open uh on lauren hunton oh no you open on uh clavon little and yeah I th- it's i think it's like all one shot he's walking through this very posh house and you know getting things just right with the decorations and the interior design and and moving in stairs and then you find the coffin and he wakes lauren hutton up and he's got a bloody mary or whatever and it's, it's time to get up and she says something about get out there and find me a virgin i think to her her ghouls or whoever the hell those other people are yeah completely non-essential but okay you've got that line get out there and find me a virgin which is funny enough especially in 85 and that's when you cut to a guy and his girlfriend in an ice cream truck like we should mention that like jim carrey drives an ice cream truck throughout this entire movie i'm not sure he ever actually works as an ice cream man at any point really (laughs) He almost works once. Uh, that one scene, yes, when he hisses but then, at the kids. Yeah, being a vampire gets in the way. So that, like, yeah, like, that should be a killer cut. Like, that should be super funny. And mm-hmm. then, you know, the conversation they're having, and it's not going there. And then, A, did you notice all those teenagers, they appear to be parked at, like, an oil derrick or something? Yes. yes. So, I mean, so there's even, like, the pumping motion of the oil derrick yeah. going on, which is, it's like a naked gun kind of joke. But yeah. before he gets out of the car, there is the cutaway, or maybe it's in the background, of another car, and you just see the dude's, like, naked butt just yeah. going to town, up and down, humping away yeah. in a convertible. And so it's, I mean, that stuff, like, in theory should work as a comedy like it yeah. should be really really funny but i'm kind of with you like it, it didn't it didn't quite make me laugh until he got out of the car and you saw that all the other car i mean like just a field of cars were just people right. just doing it and that's a good joke but like yeah i don't know i, I mean to me it feels like a common 
criticism with the movie is that just like the execution of the comedy is not quite uh, where you wanted to be. Yeah. And I well, think and- that trickles down to, yeah, like to his buddies played by um, Skip Lackey and Thomas Balatore, Jamie and Russ. Right. The freelance gynecologist, Russ. <laughs> who, who are both like likable actors. Sure, yeah. Like they're, they're clearly able to banter. Mm-hmm. I feel like one of the things that, that bugged me about it, I mean, of course I have seen the movie before, but even so it's like a lot of the jokes feel like, oh man, I, I just see this coming like a mile away. Yeah. Like the setup is just going on and on and on. And in 85, it might have felt a little different. Whereas again now, you know, everything's so compressed. Like the there's the joke about Cleavon Little coming out of the closet. Oh man, and that's just ru- and like the the, yeah. the whole first part of that scene is just her going, like looking for Seb- Sebastian, right? I think. Yep. Sebastian, Sebastian, and you're like, why are you looking for him? Sebastian, yeah. Sebastian. It's just like Jesus Christ, where is he? Yeah. And he <laughs> come out of the closet. I came out of the closet centuries ago. Jeez. Just for that really? joke. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so again, yeah, yeah, uh, I don't know. If you could, like, cut it down a little bit, it might, like, zing. Because nobody's bad in it. No. You know? I also wonder if there's a uh, a bit of a misstep by having Jim Carrey have a girlfriend in the first place. Maybe. Like, well, I shouldn't say in the first place. If they legitimately broke up after the scene in the parking lot where it just comes to a head that she's not going to have sex with him. And, you know, that's kind of the end of things in some ways. Like, I feel like that would have just, it would have motivated things a lot more. It's sort of, it makes me think of like that John Hughes stuff and um, even like better off dead or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, these are the losers. They're going to go do something dumb to try and get laid. Cause that's exactly what they do. But when you know right. he's still got a girlfriend who just didn't want, she wasn't ready to have sex with him yet, and he's right. going out trolling in Hollywood for older broads, like it just, yeah, <laughs> it just complicates things enough where you're like, I don't know, I don't feel like I like this guy as much as they want me. Exactly. To. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I mean, and I mean, what are you? Yeah, I mean, you're certainly not rooting for him, but you also, at the same time, you also know exactly what is going to happen. Right. So waiting for it to happen, I think gets. It just goes on a little too long in a way, mm-hmm. but I think I think you're exactly right. I think it's it's kind of weird because yeah, to, again, to set it up that way. Yeah. Like, why not at least let him have the motivation of just like, oh well, whatever. I feel bad because she broke up with yeah, me. I so got I'm dumped. Go do this. Yeah. yeah, and it's like because again, like all the little pieces are there. You got three teenage dudes in an ice cream truck. Rolling down Sunset Boulevard. I mean, it's ridiculous. They're wearing ties. And and probably 1985 me yeah. watching that wasn't even putting a judgment on that. Nope. Yeah. Like, it was just like, oh, yeah, that's what you do, I guess. Mm-hmm. How uh, about that but, club they go to, though, uh, that where they end up in Hollywood? And I guess we should mention that was the montage before they get here where the model is walking a lion on a leash down Rodeo Drive, which we talked about in the previous episode. Yeah, it makes uh, no sense. I did love <laughs> that, like, they're like, let's go to Hollywood. And then immediately it's like, the Hard Rock Cafe, you know, which I don't even think it's still there. I have no clue. But it's just like, oh, yeah. that, that dated it. See, this is why you don't do montages. But uh, <laughs> they end up in a club where... It appears the whole gist is you sit at a table, you have a phone, and your table has a number. And so you basically just look around the room at other tables and their numbers. And if you see somebody you like, you call them up on your phone as opposed to just walking over and (laughs) and talking to them. Which, I mean, that thing's... I, I would love to know if that was a real thing in the 80s or, or I'm what. I'm pretty sure that was a real thing. It had to be, right? I'm almost positive. Cause yeah. I, fe- I feel like I've seen places like that. <laughs> it's so almost stupid. Almost positive that's, or at least based on something real enough. But yes, yeah. a, a pretty bizarre place. Mm-hmm. But I like, but I they mean, go they there on a tip that, that you know? it, like, that's where you get ladies who want to do it. Yeah. Did you have an issue figuring out the ages of these guys? <laughs> at all i i didn't but I, I i think all i did was put the teenager label on them and i didn't really think beyond that because i mean jim carrey i just 
Like, you look at him, he's huge. I'm just like, he must be a senior. Like, I didn't, if, if they're supposed to be like 14, I'm going to, that's going to kill me. I was so confused. No, I went the opposite. I thought they were in college for like the first half of the movie. Oh. And here's why. Did they ever, ever say anything about fake ID? No. Okay. So that's what I got confused by because they were in this club and they're drinking beers. And I think the drinking age was 21 in 1985, wasn't it? Yes, surely. Are they in high school for sure? Okay. We're going to get to the bar. Okay. So here's the thing. But like it, while they're at the bar, because that's I'm like, well, wait a second. Okay. I guess they're 21. Right. And he addresses this later. No, Lauren Hunton, when he's having the first conversation, she says something about how old are you? And he says, oh, I'm 20. But, uh, you know, a lot of people think I, I could pass for 18 or whatever. So I'm like, hmm. Okay. But then later, because... <laughs> You see him in school, right? And he's in that lab where he's like mindlessly dissecting a frog. And I'm like, this looks like a high school. That is not any college that ever yeah. existed. And then obviously they have the high school dance and stuff. But then I, I think there was something where he even said that they're 17. Am I crazy? I don't remember there being an age. Dude, I was so mentioned. confused. <laughs> but But yeah, I mean, certainly in California, the drinking age has never been lower than 21. Yeah. Right. So, but that's, that's good. I mean, I, I didn't even think about it. I mean, I, I don't need the fake ID scene. I've seen that before, yeah. but it was just sort of weird to just kind of drop them into this bar and there they are drinking beer. Nobody has right. an issue with it. And Cause in high school, I wasn't going to bars to pick up chicks. Yeah. That might surprise some of our listeners. Well, yeah, a little bit. But then and he says, cause when he tells Lauren Hunton, I actually think he said he's 21. He tells her that. And so I'm like, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, he's 21. Okay, that makes sense. That's why they're in the bar. But then, but then, when he went back to the town and he's with his girlfriend in high school, I'm like, well, this doesn't make sense now. So I, I don't know. I got confused. <laughs> yeah. There was a couple moments then when it's a weird, stupid set of circumstances that allow uh, Hutton and Jim Carrey to kind of sneak out the back door of this club while. Yeah. The two buddies end up getting frisked by female police officers. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> I really liked a lot of the scenes between Hutton and Carrie here. Just that sort of like the just the way Carrie mm -hmm. plays the nervousness of all that. I thought was really oh, funny. Yeah. And he's talking about like, yeah, I'm in college, and he's lying. Obviously, again, this plays into right. my confusion. Now I think about it. it's like I'm, you know, engineer kind of thing, you know, degree I'm studying. And she says something like, I love intelligent men. He's like, yeah, I guess they're okay. <laughs> and just like the way he did that, like, again, yeah. like it made me think of Dumb and Dumber. It's just like, that's such a weird, like funny little reading for that line. And yeah. then, you know, he, whatever, like the, the night goes, he doesn't remember. He thinks he's had sex with her. But when he leaves and he's saying goodbye to them and he's like, later blood to Kulvan Little, like that made me laugh a lot, actually. <laughs> just again like the way he did it was just like so yeah eh, his intentions are good and like he doesn't mean anything bad by it. <laughs> just like, yeah you shouldn't be saying this to that guy <laughs> right well and even you know e even later there's like the kind of a nothing line of his that's like uh i don't want to be a vampire i'm a day person yeah and it's like it's kind of a groaner line but his delivery is perfect yeah like that it's it's, good. it's and I mean that's that's just Jim Carrey, I guess. Really. Sure. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like that whole scene, he plays that nervousness so like, oh man, how, like how much worse would it be if it was just like a lesser actor just blah, 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 yeah. blah, stuttering and you know? But man, you just you love all that stuff. And oh, I'm, I'm yeah. kind of assuming that he's just they just kind of let him roll. Well, that's what I was wondering because like when she starts to take his pants off and it's kind of moving down out of the frame. He starts talking about like how uh, he bets his mom would like to borrow the pattern of the outfit that she's wearing or something. <laughs> it's just like the way he's he's rambling off about that again. It's like so innocent and funny. Yeah. Did I miss something about Lauren Hutton like removing the buttons of his shirt with his teeth? Why did that happen five times in this movie? It wasn't mentioned before that, but she definitely loved biting buttons off of shirts. What the hell is and that she did about? It numerous times. Yeah, why? Why is that a, a thing? Why does that reoccur? I, I, I don't know exactly. <laughs> That's so weird. It it does kind of serve as I don't know some kind of a hallmark. Like later, doesn't she like give him a bunch of buttons after she 
has him in the changing room or something. She does. She or, does. Or, or gives him to the girlfriend, maybe. Or yeah, I, I can't uh. remember exactly. But yeah, yeah, I don't. I it's a, it's a, just a thing, just a thing that happens. Yeah, but so I, you know, a lot of the movie, and to me again, like this is where it, it doesn't work in the same way that Fright Night excels, is that. I don't think he's aware that this woman is a vampire until an hour into the movie. And I think that happens in a dream sequence too. I think that's when he like wakes up. Now, part of the fun of that is we're seeing him sort of start to show signs that maybe he is not a hundred percent normal human anymore. Right. That I like, but Mm -hmm. it's also, Again, it just like it delays the inevitable of what we already know. Right. And so it wasn't as interesting to me. And it definitely slowed the movie down, I thought, by comparison. It did. And I think, yeah, I think one of the weaknesses, again, it, it's it's sort of like it's great to have excuses to give Jim Carrey funny things to do. Like I think the, the dream sequences are funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think... A lot of that, like when he's kind of coming to grips with being a vampire, are, are pretty funny. But yeah, it, it's it's just confusing in general. Even though I, I think they explain it, but it's like we all know that if you're bitten by a vampire and you live, you are a vampire. That's what That's I it. was. It's, it's also not confused three by. times and then you're a vampire. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it was just kind of like you need virgin blood. Okay, you bit him. You got virgin blood. But you need got to do it two more times. Like, why? Why two more times? What does two more times have to do with it? Well, and, and could so, you have the title aside, "Once Bitten"? If it, <laughs> well, I guess yeah, thrice maybe bitten. So. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, that was a little unclear to me. And like again, like we're talking about the simplicity of Fright Night as far as how they do the vampire mythology. Here, right. totally, like I don't know. Even like with the virgin blood thing, that was confusing to me a little bit. Just like, come on, like you can find a virgin. Like it can't be that freaking hard, even right. in LA. I mean, I get that that's the joke, but it just but, complicates things. Also, wouldn't things. you just grab that person and put them in a cage? Yes. Like what? Yeah. Why do you have to let them roam around? Yeah. Like, the, the whole plan is is very, <laughs> very confusing. Or if you're going to like, yeah, don't go tr- looking on Sunset Boulevard at 10 o'clock at night on a Friday. Yeah. yeah like go to a bar. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Did, however, like, again, some of the little stuff in that transition. I loved the scene with him and his father and, like, Jim Carrey apparently, like, yes. either slept in the, like, clothes trunk or at least has been hanging out there. <laughs> and, again, yes. like, his dad is so passive and nice and, and yeah. just that to me is so much more funnier and it's just he, such he, a small little role. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he plays that bewilderment really well yeah. <laughs> like he's he's really concerned but doesn't right. want to say anything yeah You're... and yeah it, it works it, they they play off each other really good same same with the mom i yeah. feel like like they, they that was good stuff yeah your mother and i noticed you're looking a little pale you feeling okay <laughs> i mean it's just like as if you had a cold like i love it again yeah it's almost like oh, ferris yeah. bueller's kind of stuff but um i also <laughs> yeah. loved the uh the lunch lady that gave him the raw burger I mean, her reactions are great. There's no way she wouldn't get fired for doing such a thing. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, it's just like, oh, can I have the one that's uncooked? Yeah, here you go, kid. Jeez. Uh, um, but, but but then ag- there again, though, it, it is a little confusing because, I mean, if you suddenly wanted to eat raw beef, like, would you not say to yourself, this is weird? Yeah. Well, and I also was like, oh, okay, he he is a vampire now. Right. Like he's well, ready when he, when for he blood. When the blood at home. Yeah. yeah. You're like, oh, yeah, okay. But he's not That's yet. Like on. he's, yeah, there's still like, yeah, he's got to get bitten two more times, right? Yeah. Um, I mentioned I did like, I mean, the back and forth with the girlfriend is kind of silly. I will say at least the dance off like gave her some agency where she's, trying, <laughs> yeah. although I don't know why she's exactly fighting for him, although other she's just like jealous and threatened by this older, attractive woman. Right. Um, but, I'm kind of glad that they had moments where they weren't just at each other's throat the whole time. Mm-hmm. You know, you get the nice little scene where they're talking outside. And she's like, I really do want to do it, Mark. Like, you know, probably even more than you and blah, 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 blah. I'm just, you know, I'll know when I'll know. And yeah. like, he, you know, he kind of like, you're right. It's sort of, you know, he, he laughs about it. And then 
the button on the scene is that there's like five other classmates just sitting on a bench and they start clapping, you know, and that's, <laughs> that's kind of fun. The stuff where he shows up at the store that she works in, in the mall. Um, yeah. I thought that was like really kind of fun. Although again, it's, it's one of those things where Jim Carrey ends up in the dressing room and he's talking to Lauren Hutton, who's of course in there. And, uh, Robin is on the other side of the door in the store listening to only his side of it. Like she only hears his side of the conversation where he's like, stop it. Ouch. Get out of here. And she's like, well, if you want me out of here, maybe I will. Right. Like, and it's just yeah. one of those things that, like, oh, but that device, man. Yeah. It, it just doesn't. <laughs> like, unless it's, like, super clever. Yeah. Like, it doesn't it's work. clammy. I mean, it, it, it is a 30-year-old movie. Yeah. But, but, but still, yeah, you do get kind of exasperated. Like, come on. Like, if you heard somebody saying that, like, you'd. You'd at least realize something's up. Like, yeah, well, even like Jim Carrey, like she is talking to him, his girlfriend, right, with very legitimate questions about the things he's saying. Like, wouldn't you just take a second to respond to her, right, and yeah. come up with something, you know? And like, I, don't, I feel like they didn't even do that in that sequence. So that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, I'm glad that maybe we've left some of that in the past. Uh, but yeah, you do get the the end of that scene is is Hutton walking out with Sebastian and just randomly pushing over a old, old lady in the store <laughs> into a yeah. rack of clothes and she hasn't really shown any signs of being that kind of person prior to this no i mean she's the most like genial vampire like oh god yeah she's not she's certainly not very scary like not until the very end does she ever put any of her power out here out yeah there, I feel like and even then um, that feels neutered somewhat Oh yeah, totally. Well, I mean, if, and, and 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 yeah, I mean, you, you kind of never see her do her thing. Like, it's not like she turns anybody else, as far as I can remember. Can I make a pitch, y- bitch? You may. Here's what I thought of about halfway through this movie in regards to her and the Jim Carrey character. Maybe a missed opportunity, or maybe what they were originally going for. Risky business, where Rebecca De Mornay is a vampire. Now, doesn't that sound like an interesting movie? I'd watch that right yeah. now. Oh, absolutely. Like, it's, yeah, it gets I mean, serious, it's intense, it's, like, overwhelming, yeah. and it's it's a guy without a girlfriend, he's in and over his head. Even if he does have a girlfriend, he goes hard into being around this woman he shouldn't be around with and he knows he shouldn't be around with, right? Yeah. And here it's just, like... No, he resisted at every corner. Like she's, I don't know, she's so less interesting because of it. And uh, yeah, it just doesn't have that grip. I mean, that's the poster is is this is this vampire and this kid and like, yeah, that's got to work, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like there there are two versions of this movie we could make, and I'm talking about you and me, Sean. Yeah, let's do it. And Dow movies. Chemicals. Don't forget them. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dow. Uh, uh, press record on your. Uh, energy devices yeah. I don't know no but uh, I mean you know one it, it, it looks at everything from the Lauren Hutton point of view so you're a vampire who needs virgin blood yeah and you know let's put it in New York City Which that could be funny now. yeah and it's just like yeah how are you gonna find it but but then really get into like how you're gonna do it like why isn't there a sequence in this movie where she considers briefly like going to a church and it's like no nah, it's a terrible idea yeah. you can't go near a church yeah you know but but something besides going to a to a singles bar or it is it, i think kind of what you're saying is is it's about the jim carrey character really going through like some teenager angst like some real yeah. like decisions like you, you know not 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 trying to be a good guy yeah like just just trying to figure out or or even better maybe maybe focus it on have have, have the girl be the main character that would be interesting and how how is she dealing with that? No matter what, like a movie that really explores that stuff, mm-hmm. could be great. And I think it you know could still be very funny and and have a lot to it. Yeah, I think it's a missed opportunity in a lot of ways um, between those two. Because I mean, she's compelling enough to like watch. I think when sure. she's got something to do. But there's moments. I mean, there was a scene that ended with um, I think it was just uh, Lauren Hutton and Clavon Little. It was there was something where Lauren Hutton is laughing. And then there's just like this weird, awkward beat. And then Clavon uh, Little makes like a, a cat scratch gesture. 
which is probably you yeah. know a bad stereotype to begin with. Yeah. But just the timing of it is like it's not good. Like the editing is not good. Like they should have just cut off at the end of that. There's no. I can't imagine yeah. that got a single laugh in any right. screening of this movie. Right. <laughs> right. Well, and and that's another thing, you know, for to update this movie, have the homophobia, but deal with it. Mm-hmm. Like you, you have that whole other avenue to explore of just like the sexuality of these people, like that are just nothing but hormones. Yeah. Instead of just like gay is a joke, and it is it, it gets it gets all the disappointment sort of piles on top of each other, and it's 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 interesting too how both of these are kind of a study in a movie that ages really poorly and a movie that ages really well. Yeah, that's very true having almost almost the same subject matter yeah let's just get into this a little bit then Mm -hmm. the clavon little character yes is this very gay butler at first like it didn't i didn't think much of it i was like okay yeah he's he's gay he's a butler i can see maybe where some of the criticism came but at least you know he's gonna be he'll be funny right and it's really not there's not much there no like they don't get much comedy from that character, period, which is right. such a shame considering how amazing that dude is in Blazing Saddles, right? We, yeah. everybody knows how funny that guy can be. So then, yeah, what you're left with is just the stereotype. Yeah, and so that's yeah, that's why I think it it, it feels a little rough by the end of this. And there is this shower scene, which I think is certainly, I would imagine, maybe the larger thing that people have criticized you know in the cellular sure. closet uh, but wait, let's just talk about it because it, <laughs> yeah it's one of those things where you like it would not fly today or just be done so differently yes um and even just like the setup of it is so clumsy yeah the only person who becomes convinced that uh, jim carrey might be a vampire i think other than himself and i don't even remember if he believed it at this point is the girlfriend robin right because she talked to a guy at a used bookstore. She went to a used bookstore who, that guy just, she asked if he had any books about vampires. And man, he opened up uh, Pandora's box like he had a ton of information. His last name is Exposition, he, first name Doctor. Yes. And so yeah. one of the books he had about uh, the female vampire is that they had to bite, you know, uh, the male on the thigh, the upper thigh <laughs> for whatever <laughs> artery that is, the femoral artery, I believe. Um, sure. And so that's a telltale sign. If if your boyfriend's been bitten, look for the puncture marks. Now, Craig, I don't know. I'd like to think that uh, my non-existent girlfriend in high school would have just been able to come to me and say, "Look, don't don't get any ideas. Just right. look on your thigh or show me your thigh. I want to see if there's marks there. Right. I just just show me, okay? And then yes. I'll believe you. And Sean. Yeah, absolutely. And right there, you've hit yet another place where that th- th- a funny scene should go right Could there. Could have been funny, right? Where she's trying to see it, and he's getting the wrong idea, and she's like, that's not going to work, and then she <laughs> tries something else. Yeah. Instead, she goes to the two friends, Jamie and Russ, and talks them into do it because I, I thought you guys cared about Mark. You know, Isn't he your friend? Oh God. Then just do this. So she talks him into looking basically at his crotch while they're in the shower after gym class. Yeah. And so I guess, you know, I I can see the 1985 mindset where, oh, that'll be hilarious, right? I can kind of see that, even though I still think it's totally clunky, clunky, unbelievable way into it. Sure. But just the scene itself, it is so awkward and weird. Like they don't say there three of them are just kind of showering beside each other. And they try to do one of these things where there's just like, it's just all sight gag. So there's, right. they're, but like, they're not talking to each, like they're not saying a word to each other. And like Russ is very obviously like peering around and, and trying to get a good look in there, you know? And it just ends with them. I think he finally is like enough with this and grabs Jim Carrey from behind, which I think at that point is the only point where Jim Carrey is like, hey, what's going on here? You know? <laughs> right. He has no idea. Everyone's trying to see his yeah, me- Meanwhile, it's yeah. really, really obvious. And immediately, like, everybody else, and there's like, queers! You know, they just turn on him, yeah. and, like, the, the chanting begins, and the, the poking the fun. And then, I think the real problem is, like, <laughs> 
after that they you get the scene back in the uh, circus burger or whatever that place was where the two guy the two friends work the little kiosk stand food stand where they make burgers and jim carrey comes to them and like what was with the shower back there you know yeah. as if like they were only talking about it now it's like at night wasn't it it's like seven hours later. That's like the first time they're talking about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I had no idea. Yeah. I, I felt the exact same thing. Yeah, like you wouldn't have said that. Yeah, right like afterwards. in the moment. Or... Yeah, and so, you know. But these two guys are like in this <sighs> yeah. crisis now because people might think they're gay. Yes. And, and again, it's just like, oh man. And one of them, Jamie goes, this "I knew it. Rough. I knew it. We enjoyed it. We're Rump Rangers." And it's just like, oh, okay, gosh. oops, then you went too far there. Like that's. <laughs> Well, yeah. Like, why I mean, would you think that, that? I mean, that's, you know. Like, I, I would totally get, like, I totally get you have two characters in high school who have negative anxiety because they think, because people, because they, sure. they, they're worried people think they're gay. Yeah, yeah. Because that's happening everywhere around us every day in the U.S. And there's but enough it's, anxiety It's with treated the just as like, yeah. right. Exactly. But it's, but yeah, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's treated just in, in, it's, it's just a joke. Mm -hmm. It's just a joke. It's the same, same as like the, oh God, the trans person at the beginning in the, in the singles bar. Yeah. Where, where they, you get freaked out. Oh, it's a guy in a wig. It's yeah. Like, Jesus Christ. Well, and I so think, uh, you know, brutal. the big thing there is like, yeah, the Jamie characters is not in the trans thing, but in, after that yeah. shower scene, it's like his fear that they enjoyed it. It's, yeah, yeah, like that. I, I mean, I'm sure that bothered people. Yeah, it's like, ah, yeah. Jesus Christ, like that's what we have to deal with here. You know, <laughs> ha have your fun scene. Yeah, sure, boys will be boys, and you know, they they don't want to be picked on for this misunderstanding. But right. uh, don't take it to that level. Like I, I under, I, I can kind of understand right. where a lot of that cri but, criticism would come from. Well, yeah, and I mean. To, to to also just think about how much construction and how much screen time had to be given yeah. to just getting to that point. Mm -hmm. Like that is the whole punchline. Yep. And it's just like, man, that was not worth any of that, guys. Like there's no reason any of that needed to happen. No, and like And you did it all so people could yell fags in the shower. It would have like, been like, oh. uh I mean, I think it would have been funnier if then, like, they had actually stuck to that. Like, you know, like, Jamie, like, if he just thought he was gay, gay the rest of the movie. Like, to sure. me, like, at least, like, you get some mileage out of well, it. Yeah. But it's immediately exactly. discarded, and it's, uh, you know, they're immediately turned on by girls at the end of the movie, right? You know? Yes. Very, almost, almost desperately. Yes. In order to, like, prove that, no, no, don't worry. These characters aren't gay. Yeah, I, like, it would have been great if one of them was just like, hey, mm -hmm. wait a second. This is this is I, I like this better than trying to hit on girls in in you know laundromats. Yeah, I kind of wish you know, the just just that. Yeah, the Russ I mean, character had done that because that is the guy. I think I mentioned and we posted the picture if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, there's one point in this movie where, like in Teen Wolf, uh, he's got a, a shirt on that says uh, "freelance gynecologist," and <laughs> I swear, I'm if I'm not mistaken, I looked at it. I think it's even like a sweatshirt, which that to me, yeah, <laughs> that feels like it would be harder to come by than just like a t-shirt that somebody had put this iron on. So, for sure, uh, yeah, just like like he's days. he's putting the vibe out a little too hard, a little too hard, a little too hard. Yeah. Russ, anybody That'd named Russ in a movie in the eighties, yeah, look out. Maybe I guess Maybe. trying too hard. Well, I kind of feel like we should talk about the end because yeah. I think the rest of the plot is sort of like not that important. You know, the the dance off is sort of the big kind of thing at the end of the second act there. And then, you, you know, you're basically just teeing up this showdown with Lauren Hutton and these vampires, which I honestly, I don't even remember how they end up there, to be quite honest, at her place or wherever the hell they were. Well, yeah. Well, and, and to back up for one second, oh, I, I do actually. Yeah, okay. But just to back up for one second, sure. and we don't even have to discuss this, but I'd just like to point out, we have this whole dance-off if an unknown adult with other unknown adults tried to come into one of my high school dances, yeah, they would have like the cops would have been called. Yeah, that would have been a red flag. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how they do it in California, Sean. <laughs> you you t you seem to go out there a lot. Maybe you know it's Hollywood elites. Ugh. Anyway, no, but you're right. And and uh, so what happens is girlfriend gets arrested. Arrested. Girlfriend gets kidnapped. And right in yes. front of the burger stand. Yep. And Jim sees it happen. 
and so they all chase after they all they all pile oh that was the, right after the shower scene discussion i think so yeah i think so you're right and then they so they take off after her and they all end up there and they all end up captured by lots of goons yeah I mean, I did sort of laugh that when they're trying to break into the place, like Jamie is just so impotent. Like, <laughs> my stomach hurts. Like, you know, I can't use the bathroom. Like, it's just one of those characters. I mean, like, some of that stuff is yeah. like as old as as I am uh, and older. But uh, yeah, was there a payoff to that? No, uh, there wasn't. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't. You kept waiting for him to like take a shit on something. Yeah, like, I know. It's hoping he would just like someone would have got shit on. Yeah, no question. For about sure. It. Yeah, diarrhea yeah. party. I think we just found a, a, a title for our podcast. Oh, well, yeah. Okay, go ahead. I didn't much care for the uh, the chasing around. There's so much hissing from the cadre <laughs> of vampires. And, you know, we haven't really talked yeah. about it, but, yeah, there's, like, this group of younger vampires who clearly are the people that Lauren Hutton had turned, I guess, uh, right. into vampires, most of whom are not from any sort of current era. I did like that they all had like sort of personalized coffins in the basement of the house. Like one has like a rebel flag because he's from the Civil War, yeah. and they've got there's like twins that they just work out all the time. But one of them had like a stuffed animal uh, in his coffin, which I thought was kind of funny, stupid stuff. Yeah. But so they all get involved in this thing. Uh, it's just you've seen it before, yeah. you know. It's they capture Jim Carrey, and then the next thing you know, it's he gets out super easily because. You know, vampires don't really love fire, it turns out. But guess what they did right before this ceremony? They lit about you know, 8,000 candles in their house. Oh, yeah. You know, They're surrounded by fire, the one thing that they can't fight. Yeah. Even if it's just one tiny torch. Yeah, so you get some bad chasing, some bad, like, fighting. I mean, the vampires, like, really, they, they could have killed these guys at any moment. Like, it, oh, yeah. just with, like, a one successful lunge. They're not any good at that. <laughs> There's, I, I felt like there was a lot of bad set breaking, like doors getting busted oh, open boy. that were, didn't look like real doors. No. And somebody coming up through the concrete. concrete. breaking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> I can't believe I didn't see how all this was going to end up, Craig. I know. Did you? I remember the first time I watched it. Yeah? Okay. I didn't see that coming. And and to me, that's it's still one of my favorite examples of of the inevitable that I just did not see coming. Yeah. And I never thought about it through the entire nope, movie. Not at all. As a solution. And I, and I, honestly, I think for the reboot, I think we, we need to, we actually need to layer that in. It can't be the same ending. Yeah. So we need to layer that. In. Like it, it, it kind of puts pressure on him to really need to get laid yes. now. But, but yeah, I, I gotta say, I didn't think that's what was going to happen at all. And I didn't even think about that as a solution. Yes. And so if you haven't figured it out either, faithful listener, Robin and Jim Carrey managed to get themselves away from the chasing vampires. And when the vampires finally surround the room and break in, one of those coffins is a rockin'. Oh, yeah. And Jim Carrey and his girlfriend have just made him a non-virgin. Right. Which means Lauren Hutton has no virgin blood, which means she immediately transitions into Benjamin Button and gets real old. But not that. She didn't get as old as I was expecting her to get, right? No. I she... But but I, I, uh, this is another one of the, 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 the laughs that I treasure in the movie. Yeah. Is that as she gets older, she somehow attains a hairnet. Yep. And like, like her... Oh, her clothes <laughs> like, change entirely, don't they? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, like, it's not just that her skin becomes right, old. Yeah. She becomes an old lady within a completely different wardrobe. Yeah, she plays like six different characters in 10 seconds there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> did they just leave Jim Carrey and his girlfriend to just have sex in the in the coffin? Yeah. What did the other vampires do? Where did they go? I don't remember. I think they just left. Okay. Yeah, like, like, like that. That's the other. That's another part that's really confusing about that ending. Or did they have to go? Now they you're to... surrounded by. You might not be a virgin now, but they're still vampires. Yeah. Like you still should not be walking out of here. And and his two friends are like making out with two vampires. Yes, and that's the last so we like, see of them. They might be dead yeah. for all we know. Yeah, and maybe they're happy about that. I don't know. <laughs> but 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 what again, it's, you don't know. Yeah. You have no idea. Yeah. Um. I feel like there was the ticking clock thing a little bit there at the end. It was like the sun was coming up, so they had to get out of there. 
I think maybe that's what happened to the vampires. Maybe. But, uh, I mean, they certainly don't try to make any last second murder happen. No, uh, it wouldn't take very long. Nope. So we get to have a, a lovely shot of just Jim Carrey and his girlfriend closing that coffin. I'm going to try it one more time. Because <laughs> that's what you do. But hey, it ended strong. Yeah. Uh, what, it was an interesting. Uh, yeah, like I said, I didn't see it coming. So who am I to even make fun of that? Yeah. But that's that's one spitting, man. I don't know. I, I think really watching it side by side with Fright Night is, yeah, it's definitely a, a good education there on what yeah. you're talking about with like things being dated and just like like plot and engine and that kind of stuff and, and really kind of pace issues, I think, as much as anything. It's not a direct apples to apples comparison, I think, because I'd say Once Bitten for sure is trying for more comedy than Fright Night. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, on the whole, maybe I did laugh more at Once Bitten, but uh, I definitely enjoyed Fright Night more. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know what the lesson is in terms of you know. Again, the stuff that really dates Once Bitten is that humor now that just seems so mean. And back then, I mean, there was very few people who were going to be watchdogs for any of that stuff. Yep. But it's you know that just that sort of thing, like looking at both of those movies and how Fright Night just totally avoids any of that stuff like it doesn't have any of that on its mind whatsoever yeah no no it says something yeah and it it still manages to have some of the same thematic stuff of you know being a teenager yeah. and pressure and all that kind of stuff and sure. seduction of the older uh, mysterious figure and all that kind of thing um i don't know it'd be interesting if we get around to watching teen wolf i'd be interested in seeing uh what that movie does that works in a way that maybe does not work in one spitting yeah because i think there it's like embracing the change obviously and um you know becoming the monster inside of you if you will mm. yeah and they just never go for that yeah they just never quite get to that in this in one spitting it's like the only like real gag they get out of it is that he wins the costume contest dressed up as a vampire and he's saying the whole time i'm not wearing a costume guys uh hey let's let's talk about that for one okay yeah second. sure because that's Megan Mullally, right? That is the ticket taker, yeah. Or whatever she writes down, the names and stuff. That was another bit that totally cracked she me up. She was good, yeah. Her, her reaction, I mean, it's she has two. She has one line and one reaction. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, Jim Carrey says, I'm not a vampire. And her reaction to that is great. Yeah. It's not even words. Just... <laughs> It's just perfect. Yeah, I'll see if we can get that up on the on the Facebook site or somewhere. Uh, I think oh, it might even be in the trailer. But uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty funny little oh, moment for her. It is good. Well, Craig, good for her. I think yeah. uh, we can sink our teeth into these two movies and and uh, call them call them the undead at this point. Uh, yeah, it was it was fun to watch them. I, I have no regrets. I have almost no regrets yeah. too. I'm 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 most happy that that watching Fright Night again, so so soon after I watched it before, that I'm still like I, I feel like I can sit down and watch it again right now. There's there's quite enough in there to to keep me going. Yeah, and I, I'm really anxious to check out the reboot again. Uh, like I said, I, I did enjoy yeah, I it, and that. you know I think Colin Farrell and Anton Yelkin were both pretty darn good in it, if if memory serves. But uh, different times, different uh, takes, and it's always interesting to see. And totally. I think. You know, maybe we'll get to Transylvania 6, 5,000 at some point. But if not, uh, I would love to know if people still are watching that at all, if anybody's seen it lately and if that thing holds up. But yeah. in the meantime, come back next week. We'll tell you what we're going to watch. We'll tee it up. And we've got some more good ones up ahead because, man, we, we just, we're still tip of the iceberg here for this year. There's so yeah. much. It's true. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye.